Hi, it's Laura at Aquamarine 18 Tarot Books. Thanks for stopping by my channel today. Welcome or welcome back. This is my end of month update for May 2024. So I will timestamp below some general life updates, tarot practice updates, books I've read this month featuring the Asian Readathon TBR books, or at least most of them. I did have the odd change here and there. I also have some channel updates, things to look forward to, to talk about, and, you know, a ramble, as always. So I will say that May was not the most eventful month, and I say that in, in the best possible way. May was pretty quiet. I appreciated that May was pretty quiet. Um, I did get to spend a lot of time outside. The weather's been really nice, so that was very welcome. I feel like through the winter, I go through a bit of a quiet period in terms of druid practice and just kind of taking cues from the animals around me, you know, who a lot of whom hibernate. I definitely do a little bit of that as well through the winter. And so this time of year, spring for me where I live is really nice and really exciting because I, I get to just, I get to be outside so much more and, and that's so nice. So I did some planting of vegetables and herbs in my backyard. I went for my first canoe of the season, which was wonderful. Went really early in the morning. I got to see a heron and some kingfishers and red-winged blackbirds and Baltimore Orioles and, and many other bird neighbors while I was canoeing, which was great. Um, we saw some snakes as well. The same day as that, I got to have my first swim outside. That was in a neighbor's pool, so there was heating involved, obviously but it was nice to get to do that. It does feel kind of scarily early to be able to do that. I feel like maybe earlier than ever, um, but it was really refreshing and, and I love swimming, so that was really good. And yeah, just, just overall a good May. In terms of tarot decks, tarot decks purchased or acquired this month, that is zero, so I don't have any brand new decks to show you that have come in this month. I will say I was very, very kindly offered uh, a copy of a deck that is on my wish list, the Magical Nature Tarot, which I accepted. And so I'm waiting for that. I will have that deck, which has been on my wish list for quite some time, um, to show you at some point in June. And I'm excited for that, but it's not here yet. So no new decks. I have rehomed a few in May and I continue to rehome a couple of decks here and there. I have a bag of decks that I am gradually rehoming. So more actually went out of my collection in May uh, than came in, which, you know, there's, there's the odd month where that happens for me, not too, too often, but that's interesting. Um, I am not doing a huge like collection shrink or anything like that. I'm not gonna make a video about that. Uh, but I am rehoming a handful and my wish list is pretty small. So I don't know, you know, what the net outcome 2024 will be for my tarot collection, but it might be pretty, it might be pretty um, balanced between rehoming decks and bringing decks in actually based on where that is so far. In terms of um, other tarot practice related things to share, I took a class this past month, which is great. I took the Modern Fortune Tellers class with Tom Benjamin, and this is the first time I've taken a class with him online. I did get to participate in um, you know, a workshop that he offered at Reader Studio last month, which was great you know, to get to do that in person and hang out a bit. But I took the online class, which was five weeks, talking about the, the Modern Fortune Teller, and we had all kinds of great conversations in the class. Um, and it was a really good experience. I really enjoyed being part of the small group and talking about, you know, different kinds of tarot reading questions, like ethical questions and, and types of readings that we will do and won't do and predictive reading and how it might work and, and different ways of working with cards to do different things. Really, really great experience. So I'm sure it will not be my last class with him, but definitely recommend um, if you're looking for a tarot class to see what he has um, available. I had a really, really good time. So in terms of decks that I used for that class, I'm just looking down because I've got decks here. Um, I used 
the Marseille Prendre de Vie, and I have here the small one uh, by Krista of Angie Kay's Tarot. This is one of my absolutely favorite Marseille decks. And the small one is good because, you know, with the desktop uh, and being in a class and taking notes and things like that, that was a good, uh, a good deck for me to use for that class. I also used the um, Diverse Terra de Marseille, which is a deck that is um, on my playing cards, but that my friend kindly gifted to me. I really love this deck as well. So I wanted to focus on working with Marseille decks for the class for Marseille for May. But I did also want to have a Smith Weight deck with me. I didn't know, you know, what if anything the deck focus of the class would be. I figured kind of any deck that you wanted to use would be fine, which which was the case. Uh, but I wanted to have a Smith Weight system type of a deck available to me in case I in case I wanted that. And so for that, I used the Fyodor Pavlov which is a deck that I adore. <laughs> I, I love this deck very, very much. And it seems to be one of those ones that makes its way onto my table even when I've put it away and made a decision to work with something else. This one seems to come out. And I did do a reading in the class that I want to revisit with that, so I'm going to keep that in the order that it is in. So... Marseille for May <laughs> was something that I talked about doing um, in a previous video. I know other folks do Marseille May as well and maybe read a book based on Marseille tarot or work with Marseille decks exclusively. Uh, I initially thought that I would work with Marseille decks exclusively, but then the forest lore tarot kept showing up, <laughs> kept showing up on my table somehow. Who knows how that happened. And this is just such a springtime you know, color palette. And I really like this deck. I really like working with this. My friend Tegan at Cosmic Creeper mentioned this deck. And so I, I credit slash blame <laughs> Tegan for this purchase with love. Um, I'm really glad because I really, really like this deck so much. So my Marseille for May was questionable. I did not work with only Marseille decks, but I did work with quite a few. And I started a Marseille book, which I had actually started once and didn't finish because my focus had just shifted. So I had gone back to um, the Marseille Tarot Revealed by Yoav Bendov, a classic, of course, lots of folks know and have read this book. And I have gotten to page 207 <laughs> out of 361. So I made it through more than half. I will review this more thoroughly once I have finished it. There are some really interesting ideas. I really like reading his description of the open reading. Um, I'm struggling at this point, I think, in terms of tarot books, for a tarot book to be this kind of card by card meaning, which this book is not in its entirety, but it does uh, certainly have lengthy chapters that are kind of card by card descriptions is not really what I'm looking to read right now in a tarot book. It's I just feel like I maybe learn a bit less and that I've read a lot of them. But the sections that are not the the card descriptions I'm I've quite enjoyed. So I'm going to continue on with this, just not during Marseille May. It will be during Tarot Assortment June. <laughs> there you go. So not the most consistent, but so it goes. So in terms of books I have read this month uh, for May, my reading was largely shaped by Asian Readathon, which I've completed for a number of years now and that I always really enjoy. Um, so you'll notice that a lot of those books from my Asian Readathon TBR have made it into my reading. I think I maybe missed two books that I had put on my TBR, but I also ended up reading a few that I had not 
necessarily put on my TBR, but that did, you know, fit in the Asian readathon umbrella in that there are books by Asian authors. I had a really good reading month in terms of some statistics. Just briefly, I read a total of 10 books and a total of 3,235 pages, which is the most pages that I've read in a month so far in 2024. Um, I, I feel like I definitely read a lot in May. And I will say though that some of that is because I had um, some books that were longer books that I had actually started in April and carried forward into May. I count books based on when I finish them. So that page count is probably a little bit high compared to what I actually read in May, but it's still the biggest reading month I've had. I have an average of 4.1 star rating for my books for May, which is pretty good, but I would like my star rating to be higher than 4.1 and several months it actually has been higher. So I would like it to be higher. I read four physical books, which I'll share here and six ebooks, which I will put a picture of up in the corner over there somewhere. And this exactly corresponds to the number of nonfiction, which is the four physical books versus the number of fiction, which is the six ebooks. This is pretty common for me. I like nonfiction in hard copy a lot of the time, especially if I think I'm going to be making notes. So that pattern holds here. So the books that I've read in May, I had started in April and this was on my April TBR, but finished in May. Queer Palestine and the Empire of Critique by Syed Achan. And this is a book that is published by Stanford University Press in 2020. And it looks at LGBTQ organizing in Palestinian context. And it is a autoethnography um, and, very, and a very personal ethnography that, that includes a lot of focus on the author's own involvement with and engagement in uh, these different kinds of organizing and, you know, very much intersectional kind of struggle in terms of um, Palestinian LGBTQ organizing, you know, of course, also intersecting with uh, anti-racist organizing, for example, with uh, feminist organizing as well. So this, I, I learned a lot from this. I enjoyed this book um, as a ethnography, certainly. Um, I think that the author has some interesting analysis around intersectionality, around identity politics, and, and particularly around the different kinds of pressures, like kind of normalizing pressures that LGBTQ plus Palestinians experience. Um, and that the, these movements experience in terms of the different kinds of constraints and pressures around how those struggles are articulated, how those politics are articulated, um, you know, issues around kind of funding in, in movements and things like this, all really interesting if you're interested in uh, social justice movement organizing, you know, in general, I would say that this would be a really interesting read for you. I would recommend that book. I also read, and this is responsible for a good chunk of the page count, and this is another one that I read in April, um, but finished in May, the complete book of astrological geomancy, The Master Divination System of Cornelius Agrippa by Priscilla Schwey and Ralph Pastka. This has been on my list for a long time, and putting astrology study on my Druid Apprentice curriculum made me finally get to it. <laughs> so I really like a curriculum or a study plan to actually make me stick to things. I have wanted to seriously study astrology for a long time and it's never quite stuck. I've kind of started and dipped in and out and, and having a practice is never quite stuck. But AODA Druidry is giving me a way to have it stick that makes sense for me and I really appreciate that. So what this book does 
is explains how to incorporate astrology into a geomancy reading in terms of thinking about the time of the asking and formulation of the question that the chart that the geomancy chart is then cast for and looking at where different planetary influences fall then in terms of the houses of the geomancy chart and the relationship of those planets to the different geomancy um, symbols that could show up in the chart itself as well as the, um, the zodiac signs. So the beginning portion of this book is explaining how to do all of that. Uh, I would not say this would be good for someone who doesn't already know geomancy to some extent. It's definitely not a total beginner geomancy book. But the first 78 pages basically explain a very quick explanation of geomancy and then how to do this kind of astrological geomancy specifically. And then the whole rest of the book is interpretations. So for example, it will say, okay, you have, you have populace in the 11th house. And then it says a paragraph for populace in the 11th house alone, populace in the 11th house with the sun, populace in the 11th house with the moon and so on. And you could read all of those if you or more than one, if you had multiple planets there. So for every geomancy sign in every house of the geomancy chart, you get this. And then you also have interpretations for different combinations of witnesses um, forming each judge figure, which if you know how to read geomancy, you know what I'm talking about. And if you don't, you don't, and that's okay. Um, you know, for the purpose of explaining this book, the beginning part is kind of the how-to part. And then the rest is um, interpretations for different possibilities that could come up in a reading, right? So in reading this, I did not read every single possible interpretation end to end. Um, because that would make no sense, but I've been playing around with the techniques and reading the interpretations for the charts that I have cast. I like this. I do find some of the bits in the beginning are explained in a weird way. And, <laughs> um, there's one or two things that they say in here where I'm just like, what? Um, they keep referring to sign-based aspects as mundane astrology, which is not the same thing. I don't know why they're calling it that. Um, mundane astrology being a kind of world events approach, not about the type of aspect. So I'm not sure why that is like that. But they keep saying it repeatedly. Um, there's a couple of things in here that I frankly just decided to do differently that in ways that make more sense to me based on my existing geomancy practice. But as a reference, I really, really like this. I think this is out of print, but I got it on a books and it wasn't very expensive. I think it's pretty easy to find. I read 111 Oracle spreads for every day, enhance your reading, spark your intuition and deepen your connection with any card deck by crystal banner. This caught my eye because it is a oracle spread book, which I've never seen before. I think I will share a review of this book as a separate video. I did film a review video for this actually, and I wasn't like super thrilled how it came out, so I didn't post it, but I think I probably will. Um, I really like this. I'm not sure what makes these oracle spreads instead of tarot spreads. I do think that it's ultimately a marketing thing in some ways. Um, I also suspect that the reasoning is that the author Crystal Banner tested the spreads out with oracle cards and therefore conceptualized them as oracle spreads. But in terms of functionality, any of these could be tarot spreads as well. Like there's absolutely no reason that they couldn't. You can tell from my post-its that I found quite a few that I liked. I think that this would be a really good beginner book to gift someone um, in terms of a spread book. I think it has good range. I think it's written in accessible, approachable language. I think it doesn't assume too much in terms of pre-existing knowledge. Like it explains what a spread is. So I think whether for tarot or oracle, this could be a good beginner book. And I'm glad for that because I'm always looking for books like that to recommend to total beginners. And I would gift somebody that book for sure. The last nonfiction book that I read this month is An Immense World, 
How Animal Senses Reveal the Hidden Realms Around Us by Ed Yong. And this book, as the subtitle suggests, is all about the sensory perception of different kinds of species. So sight and hearing and sensitivity to electromagnetism and sonar and all kinds of senses and how different animals have and use those senses to navigate the world. Ed Young is a science journalist, I believe, and this book is fantastic. This is one of the best books that I've read all year. <laughs> I love this book. I want to give this book to lots of people. He has another book about microbes and I now want to read a book about microbes. <laughs> I really, really, really enjoyed this. It's accessible for somebody who is not a science person. It is funny. It's conversational. It's very well researched. It's very well cited. Um, it has a politic that I, that I respect around, around conservation you know, and things like this, it is very, very, very well done and very well written. And I think that th I, I love it. I love it. If, if the topic of this even slightly interests you, I would say go out and pick up a copy. You can't go wrong. It's fabulous. I can't wait to read his book about microbes, <laughs> which is not a thing I ever thought I would say, but there it is. I, I just think it's excellent. Um, five stars, resounding five stars. And I wouldn't have known about that book except that my friend Corbin gave it five stars on their Goodreads and I saw it and it appealed to me. So I appreciate that. Now, getting into the fiction, the six fiction that I read for, um, mostly for Asian readathon prompts. I did read more books than there were prompts, but you know, I often do. I read in no particular order the Surviving Sky by Critica H. Rao. This had been on my to-read list for quite a long time, actually. Uh, it's a debut fantasy novel, the beginning of a trilogy. It is uh, Hinduism inspired, certainly. Uh, it has a really interesting setting in terms of people living on these kind of floating islands that they power and that fly um, above the the land and are kind of necessary for humans to be living on at the time this novel is set because the kind of weather uh, has gotten so extreme and so bad on the ground that that staying up on these floating islands is how humanity has has continued and there are, there, there's a lot of interesting components to this book. Um, there are kind of social, social, political kind of dynamics on the island that is set. And there's a number of these floating islands that are in communication with each other. There are kind of political dynamics in terms of the decision-making council and who gets to be a part of it uh, based on particular kinds of abilities that people might have or not have. Um, in terms of their ability to kind of manipulate energetic currents and things like this. Um, at the center of the plot is um, two characters and their marriage and the strains that these different socio-political dynamics and the, and the context overall are kind of putting on that relationship. I liked so much about this. I liked how the relationship was, was written. I enjoyed the setting very much. I thought that the kind of world building was really thorough and really interesting. Um, I have gotten a advanced copy of the sequel, so I am definitely going to continue this trilogy. Started with um, The Surviving Sky by Critica H. Rao. Very, very good. Very, very good as a fantasy debut as well, I will say. I read The Terracotta Bride by Zen Cho. Zen Cho is an author that I have read before um, and enjoyed. And The Terracotta Bride is a short, um, novelette, I guess it would be, because it's about 50 pages, a novelette. And the Terracotta Bride has to do with the afterlife and a character being 
you know, arranged into a marriage in the afterlife with a man who has enough resources in the afterlife to kind of buy them a cushy afterlife compared to some other possibilities that that they could be facing. And this is just, this one is just so interesting. And I feel like because it's 50 pages, there's very little I can say about it that doesn't completely give it away. Suffice to say, I thought it was, it was great. Check it out. Re read the synopsis and if it appeals to you, then check it out. I think it's great. I read Jump Knots by Hao Jingfang and this is a book that I chose. Uh, there's a prompt in Asian Readathon about a uh, like something you would want in your next life and so I thought of the, the career I would want and because of this following a group of people trying to solve some puzzles related to uh, like alien first contact. <laughs> it's like that's a that's a job that I would want. Yeah. <laughs> I love things like this. Like I, um, when I was teaching, I taught, um, the film Arrival based on the Ted Chang story. And I've taught the story as well. I, I love, I love science fiction as everybody knows. Trekker, love any of those kinds of um, things. So that's why I picked Jump Knots. And this was really good. This was not what I expected at all, um, uh, in terms of, in terms of science fiction, but it was very interesting very interesting i was a little bit challenged by jump knots in that i didn't feel particularly attached to the main protagonists for an extended period of the beginning of the book i just i just didn't connect um and that was a little bit of a barrier at the start but things really picked up uh, further, further in. And, and this one too, like so much, I think science fiction does, has some interesting kind of political aspects and different kind of interstate alliances, um, at play. And there's kind of a bit of a, not quite a space race, but kind of, uh, dynamic that, that means that there's a lot of, uh, kind of espionage around this potential alien first contact. Like the, the first parts of the book read a lot like a kind of spy book, which was interesting and not quite what I expected, but I really enjoyed. So I was happy to have found, you know, a new author that I would love to read more from. I read 100 Shadows by Wang Jiangun. This was an advanced copy of a book that I got from NetGalley uh, by again, an author that I've never read before. And 100 Shadows is I don't want to say based on because it's very, very, very fictionalized, but it makes reference to a incident in which um, several people were killed who were protesting um, a kind of mass eviction in Seoul in South Korea. And this book this is a hard to describe one as well. Um, in 100 Shadows, they are in a building that is, that is being gentrified, basically like a series of building, like a cluster of buildings that are lettered like A, B, C, D. And one different ones are getting um, developed and the tenants are being pushed out. And it's kind of a mix of residential and commercial tenants who are all being, being pushed out. And alongside this, people's shadows are detaching from their body. And so this is where the 100 Shadows title comes in. And there's kind of a, there's kind of a romance plot in there as well um, between two of the main characters. And this is a very kind of atmospheric book. I liked it. I liked it very much. I thought it ended very abruptly and it's very, um, it's very non-linear. It is almost abstract. It's, I, I would say that as a, as a novel, like it is very conceptual. It's very much a conceptual novel. I liked the writing very much. Um, I would read something else by the author in a, in a second. It was an unusual pick for me. 
but but this is also why like I have fun with these readathons because I find books that I wouldn't have necessarily turned up um, otherwise, and so that's that's fun. I read Goddess of the River by Vaishnavi Patel. And Vaishnavi Patel is the author of Kaikei as well, which I really, really, really enjoyed. And Goddess of the River similarly has a basis in mythology, um, the Mahabharata specifically, which I have not read and I don't have a ton of familiarity of. Um, so I can't, you know, really comment on the kind of proximity to the source material or not in, in talking about this book. I really enjoyed Goddess of the River. It follows um, a main character who is a river, um, the Ganges River. And her brief time wherein she is put into living a human life and she returns to being a river that's a spoiler actually <laughs> but it happens like fairly early on in the book and uh, and her relationship with with humans including you know a, a, a part human who is her son and this kind of warring factions of of humans that are in conflict with each other that she has various kinds of relationships with, um, as well as her relationships with other deities as well. This was fabulous. I really liked Kakei. I really liked this. Um, I find that Vaishnavi Patel writes really interesting characters. I think writing a character who is a river is so fascinating and it was done so well. I think she writes relationships, like familial relationships, really, really well. Um, it, you know, is a, is a fantasy and I think as a fantasy it reads really, really well. I will pick up whatever she writes next in a second. Uh, you know, I don't have to read the synopsis to know that. I thought that this was absolutely excellent. I... I really like this a lot and I knew I would this this I knew that I would based on KKE I knew that Goddess of the River would be a book that I really really liked I'm not even sure which one I liked more they're quite different actually but but I liked them both very much finally a book that I did not expect to read in May and I did not put on my Asian readathon TBR though I could have um, I decided to read Raven Stratagem by Yoon Ha Lee and Raven's Stratagem is the second book in a trilogy. The first is Nine Fox Gambit. And the third one is Revenant Gun. And I read Nine Fox Gambit, which was quite a, um, a celebrated and awarded novel. I read in 2020, I believe. And I just never f continued the trilogy. And I don't know why. Because Nine Fox Gambit was really excellent. I, I really liked it. I found it very hard to follow. <laughs> I found it very hard to follow. Yoon Ha Lee is a um, author who has a professional background in mathematics. And in the way he writes science fiction, his background in mathematics is very evident. In this science fictional world, the technology is dependent on kind of what calendar is used. And so... Um, challenges to kind of the official imposed calendar impact how technology functions and how time is counted is, is a politically contentious question and it's is completely fascinating and the space battles are epic and I really wish that I had read Raven Stratagem much more closely on having finished Nine Fox Gambit because I really wish Nine Fox Gambit was fresher in my mind. Um, in Nine Fox Gambit, the main character, um, Charisse, she is, um, she's she's going into a space battle, you know, <laughs> and um, something that they decide to do is to reawaken a long dead general whose consciousness has been preserved to help because he is a kind of master strategist. 
he also, in the time when he was alive, killed his own crew. And so he is awakened and kind of inserted into Charisse's consciousness. And so they're kind of both, both in there. And that's the first book. And this gives some hint as to how, you know, it can be a bit hard to follow, but you just have to kind of go with it. But it's, but it's fabulous. And Raven's stratagem was excellent too. I missed the, the two character interplay that the first book set up. I, I wanted more of that. But Raven's stratagem was excellent in its own right. There was a excellent twist that I didn't even think about as being a possibility, but as soon as it happened, I was like, yes, <laughs> this is the thing that I wanted. I didn't know, but this is totally the thing that I wanted. And I am going to read the third book, not four years from now, sooner. I actually think, and this isn't so good for kind of reading along and things like this, but I think that I may do late in the year this year, I may do a monthly TBR where the focus is sequels and finishing up series because I have, I have quite a few <laughs> series on the go that I need to finish that I, or that rather that I would like to finish. Reading is a joy, right? It's not a have to, I don't have to do anything <laughs> in this area, but I want to, I have series on the go that, that there are installments published that I have not yet read that I want to read. Maybe I'll make a video about that. And maybe I'll make a monthly TBR focused on that because reading Raven Stratagem reminded me to not leave that much time in between. So Revenant Gun will be on that TBR. Last thing on the topic of books I want to touch on here is the Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler. I have mentioned before that I would like to reread this in July of this year because, you know, chapter one starts in July 2024. I know there's other folks who are interested in reading this um, and in reading this this year. I would love to do something collectively with those who are interested. I'm thinking what that will look like is some combination of Discord and then if folks want to, we could Zoom as well. I'm not going to put Discord and Zoom stuff in description boxes of videos because I'm unfortunately familiar with Zoom bombing as a phenomena from teaching through COVID. I just don't want that kind of disruption. If there's, you know, nine other people besides me or fewer who want to Discord chat about this, then I'll make us a group message and we can talk about it. Um, Discord is free and very, um, I would say fairly easy to use, um, you know, if you want to join. And then we could also talk about, about, um, a zoom as well. My copy of of Parable of the Sower has a reading group guide in it with some different um, discussion questions. We could work from that. I also have some material that I've compiled in other contexts. Like I've taught Octavia Butler's work in, in university courses before, not this book specifically, um, but I could draw on some of that for some secondary materials. We could do really anything, right? But if you're interested, in reading this with me starting in July, who knows how long it'll take. Drop me an email and I'll put that in the description box, aquamarinexviii at gmail.com. And I'll make a dedicated video, like a quick five minute one, just sharing that information as well. Shoot me an email and I will make a BCC'd list and email everyone and we'll coordinate something about how to read this book together. Um, the email thing again is not to exclude anybody, if you email with interest, you are welcome. Um, I just don't want to deal with nonsense by posting access to servers and and Zoom links on the open interweb, right? So think about it. If you'd like to read this with me in July, you know, we can collectively set the pace. This is not intended to be, you know, homework. <laughs> I do suggest, you know, especially if you're unfamiliar with this or unfamiliar with Octavia Butler's work, do go on Storygraph or somewhere like this and take note of the content warnings that come along with this one. It is not an easy book to get through. Uh, it is a very impactful one that it does touch a lot of themes and topics that can be very difficult 
more so for some of us than others to read because of their proximity to our personal experiences, right? So just be mindful of that and, and take good care. Um, I will suggest on Discord, Discord chat that things could be, you know, spoiler hidden behind a spoiler tag if they contain content like that, but do kind of proceed with that amount of caution. Uh, I will, you know, do my utmost to cultivate a discussion space that is um, mindful of, of that, right? And come up with some secondary sources as well. And then if folks want to make some kind of collaborative video for YouTube talking about this, like I would be totally open to that too. It's not something that I was really envisioning coming from this, but who knows? If you would like to read this with me, email me and we will collectively figure out what that looks like for us. I would be happy to have reading buddies. And I know that for July, I'm going to give myself a pretty light TBR besides this one, because this is a, it's an intense book and it's a book with a lot of things to talk about and things to consider and things to reflect on in it, not just heavy content wise, but like conceptually as well. So I'm going to give myself a, a not too heavy July besides that one. So that's, that's the book stuff for the month. Next up is the deck wish list check-in or deck to explore list check-in the list that I keep in the back of my planner of decks that intrigue me so this hasn't changed much um I have not been doing too much shopping I am going to check off um in my list while I'm here with you on camera the magical nature tarot since I do have a copy of that on its way to me and with that one being checked off almost everything else on the list is forthcoming decks actually decks that are not even available yet with the exception of the inner ecology oracle which i am still interested in and the Inner Eye Oracle by Stephen Bright, which is mass market and available, which I'm interested in, but I'm not going to get until I'm actually doing more directed playing card study. Other than that, it's all forthcoming. Now, I do want to add something <laughs> to the to explore list because, and this is not a deck that had been on my radar at all, but my friend mentioned to me that her current favorite deck is the Sufi Tarot, which is a mass market deck. It's a Hay House deck. And the artwork is absolutely beautiful. And, you know, this was not a deck that was on my radar at all. Uh, but this friend is a superstar recommendation maker in my experience. I credit this friend with introducing me to some authors who are, I would say, are now favorites. So I want to give this a, an explore. So I'm putting the Sufi Tarot on my to explore wish list. The creator has some videos um, on YouTube where she talks about the deck and the kind of significance of some of the cards and, and the content and stuff. So I'm, I'm going to look into that one because the, the artwork is gorgeous and it's not one that I ever would have thought of, but I've had a recommendation and I'm going to look into that one. So that is my to explore list. It's short. It's, it is quite short and that feels, that feels good. That feels good. So I'll just end on a quick note and this is a kind of YouTube content making update note and that is just that I've been kind of struggling with making content I've been having a lot of fun with top tarot trumps the the tag started by Masha which I've been you know sharing every two weeks or so and I've been batch filming those generally um, you know filming maybe two of them in one go and then staggering them forward but other than that I've I've not been having the easiest time this month in the last month or two trying to sit down and, and film things and it's not necessarily even a lack of ideas 
or a lack of inspiration. And it's not at all indicative of me having any kind of slowdown in my tarot practice, because if anything, I'm really quite invigorated right now. What it is indicative of is that I want to be outside rather than sitting in here. It's not always conducive to film in my yard. My neighbor has a dog, you know, and grandchildren are visiting a lot of the time. And, and it's tough for me to film outside in a way that's not really distracting for, for me and you. But I just, I just want to be outside. <laughs> and so you may notice a slowdown, I think, for me for the next couple of months in terms of how much I'm filming and how much I'm posting. I'm definitely sticking with top tarot trumps because I'm having a great time. I'm definitely sticking with monthly updates and TBRs because those are great fun for me and I'm planning my reading anyway, so why not share it? Uh, but I've, I've been trying to aim kind of weekly-ish without putting too much pressure on myself and I'm feeling increasingly like over the summer that that's just not going to be feasible because there are so many things I want to do. And most of them are hikes. <laughs> and canoes and nature photography and, you know, outdoor adventuring of various sorts. So I'm not going anywhere. I'm not, you know, stopping making content or anything like that. But if, but if I go a month with nothing, um, it is not to worry. It's not that anything is wrong. I haven't gone a month without filming before ever, I don't think, but I'm feeling it like a possibility. Um, so that will that that may happen. It may not happen. We'll see but I did just want to share that I'm having a bit of a hard time um, Getting videos up. So I hope that folks are folks are understanding. I am still here um, You know commenting on other folks videos here and there but as the weather warms up and I can be outside I just that's that's where my um, my energy is right now, so maybe I'll I'll try to insert some footage of some of my favorite outdoor places here and there in the coming months if I can. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you had a great May. Um, if you got up to anything particularly interesting in May, do let me know and I will see you all again pretty soon, I'm sure. Bye.